um, it's going to be okay. So what I've planned for this is to talk about linear regression, but I'm not going to talk about um, the methodology behind it. I'm going to talk much more about like how to use it, some warnings, that sort of thing. I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then um, <clears throat> I'll leave lots of time at the end to ask questions because I think like for stat stuff, that's the way to do it. Okay, cool. So imagine that we want to find out the relationship between BMI and body fat percentage. Now, I appreciate that this is probably a really simple relationship and you would never really ask this question in real life, but just bear with me because this, this is a really nice learning example, okay? So <clears throat> we got um, on Tottenham Court Road and measure BMI on 7,000 people and we calculate their body fat percentage as well. And on the scatter plot over here, we just plot their BMI against their body fat percentage. And right away, it's really obvious. You can see that as BMI increases, um, your body fat percentage increases. But <clears throat> can we quantify the relationship? Can we say something more specific, like um, for one unit increase in BMI, how much is your body fat percentage increasing by? And you can do that by doing a linear regression. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we actually do a linear regression, I should say, never, ever, ever, ever open a data set and start doing a regression. That's like the worst thing you can do in your life, right? Well, <laughs> when it comes to statistics, don't just open a data set and start putting models. When you open a data set, the first thing you need to do is just understand your data, make sure you understand where the measurement error is from, um, how your date variables have been measured, clean them and that sort of thing. And then think about what question you want to answer. And in this case, we want to answer what is the relationship between BMI and body fat percentage. And once you have that question in your mind, then you start thinking about what method you need to use to answer that question. And the method we need to use in this case is a linear regression. <clears throat> now, one of the assumptions behind a linear regression is that your residuals are normally distributed. And I'll explain to you what a residual is in a little bit. But a neat little hack, if you like, um, <clears throat> to ensure that your residuals are normally distributed is to make sure that your uh, outcome variable, in this case, body fat percentage, is normally distributed. So what I've done here is I've just drawn um, a histogram of body fat percentage, and I've just overlaid a normal distribution on top of it. And, you know, this looks really normal. Like, I'd be quite happy to model this um, in a linear regression. <clears throat> but of course, you know, I'm a little bit geeky and I want to know if we could do better than this, this distribution to make it more normal. So what I've done here is just I've drawn distributions of different transformations of body fat percentage. Here, for example, this is the cubic transformation. This is the square transformation. This is identity. So this is just the same as that. That is just the body fat percentage distribution. And you can see that some of these distributions are really not normal, like the cubic and the square and the square root. They're not normal at all. The ones that are the best fits are maybe the square root, but really the identity, just the <clears throat> normal body fat distribution, that's probably the most normally distributed um, transformation. So we're going to stay with that in our um, analysis. And also, just to re-emphasize, you should clean your data, you should check for outliers and those sorts of things. Just because I'm not talking about them a lot doesn't mean they're not important. I think actually they're the most important things that you can do. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna now regress BMI on body fat percentage. And what this graph is, this is the exact same graph as I showed you before with BMI on the x-axis and body fat percentage on the y-axis. And these are the points, each point representing an individual. And this red line is our linear regression, okay? And the way that a linear regression is actually fit is that it tries to balance off the positive and negative residuals. So what is a residual? So the distance from this point here to the line, that's a residual. The distance from this point here to the line, that's another residual. And this, the line is basically trying to balance off all these positive residuals against all the negative residuals. It's trying to make the average of the residuals zero, essentially. 
And that's all that a linear regression is trying to do. <clears throat> and now a line is defined by two points, okay? And in a linear regression, it's defined by the constant, the constant being the value on the y-axis when the x is zero. And also the second point that it's defined by is the gradient. So how much body fat percentage is increasing by per unit increase in BMI. And I'm going to talk about each of these coefficients in detail uh, now. So don't worry if you didn't understand a word of what I just said. Um, <laughs> so, but basically, when we fit our regression, this is just um, all, all I've done is regressed body, BMI on body fat percentage in my stats package. And this is the output that comes out. Um, something to point out is that the R squared of this regression model is about 29%. And so what that means is that 20%, 29% of the variance in body fat percentage is explained by BMI, which is actually kind of impressive. Okay. <clears throat> now, the stuff that comes out of your regression, this is the important part, okay? And I'm just going to translate this into an equation. So what these values here are saying is that body fat percentage is equal to 1.21 which is my constant, plus 1.03 times BMI. And again, just to recall, a line is defined by two points, and these are the two points, the 1.21 and the 1.03. And we're going to talk about what each of these values are um, now. But before I do, is there any questions? Because, yeah, I'm never sure what um, level to pitch these talks at, so if you have a question, just interrupt me. Okay, great. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's important. Like technology is, I don't even understand how technology works. Right. Okay. So this is where we were. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> all I'm going to do on this slide here is I've just rewritten the equation that we had. Oops. I've rewritten the equation that we had and just redrawn the graph. Yeah. So everything is just as what it was on the previous slide. But let's try and concentrate on understanding what this coefficient means, okay? Now, this coefficient <clears throat> is going to be the mean body fat percentage when BMI is zero. Because when BMI is zero, body fat is going to equal 1.21. But do you know what? That actually makes no sense, right? Because... Um, have you ever met anyone with a BMI of zero? <laughs> like it, it, it's not a useful, it's not a meaningful coefficient, um, constant value. So a way to make that constant value a bit more meaningful is by centering on your mean BMI. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is find out what mean BMI is in the population. And mean BMI is about 28.6, okay? So we generate a new variable called centered BMI, which is the person's BMI minus 28.6. And we rerun our regression. We regress body fat on this new variable called centered BMI. Yeah, and this is the stuff that comes out. So <clears throat> body fat percentage is now equal to 30.65, yeah, plus 1.03 times centered BMI. Notice the 1.03 is the same. The only thing that's changed is what the constant is. And that's because effectively what we have done is we've shifted the scale on the x-axis to the left a little bit. But what this um, <clears throat> equation is saying is that the mean body fat percentage when centered BMI is zero is 30.65. And you have to think about then when is centered BMI zero and centered BMI is zero when the person's BMI is 28.6. So basically, this equation is saying that <clears throat> the mean body fat percentage of a person with a BMI of 28.6 is 30.65, yeah? And to me, that's much more informative than this 1.21. This 30.65 is, is a much more meaningful value. So when you look at both equations, the, the one up here, and the one down here, the one that's more informative to me is the one with the 30.65 as a constant. So just to recap what I've what we've talked about so far, um, <clears throat> we first fit 
a linear regression on the data that we collected and we said that body fat percentage is equal to 1.21 plus 1.03 times BMI. Then we thought that coefficient, the constant is a num, very useful. So we're gonna center a BMI on its mean and refit the regression. And that's what we did here. And notice that <clears throat> the points, the scatter plot looks identical. The line looks identical. The slope is the same in both cases, yes? Um, and, and you can see that it's the same because it's 1.03 here and 1.03 here. Yeah, the only difference is the scale of the x-axis. This, this one on the left is going from 20 to about 60, whereas the one on the right is going from about minus 20 to about 40. And that's because all we've done is we've shifted the x-axis to be on mean BMI, yeah? So that's the constant <clears throat> that um, defines a line. The next thing that's defining this line is this coefficient, the 1.03. And what does that 1.03 represent? Well, we're gonna work through a worked example of what it represents shortly, but just very briefly, what it means is that for every unit increase in BMI, body fat percentage is increasing by 1.03%, okay? And I'm gonna work through this example with you to convince you that that's right. So I've just rewritten up here the equation from the previous slide. And imagine we wanna compare the body fat percentage of a person with a BMI of 29 to a person with BMI of 30. What is the difference in body fat percentage of a person with a BMI of 30 to a person with BMI of 29? And I know that it's 1.03. And I'm gonna work that out with you now. So for a person with BMI of 29, their body fat percentage is going to be 30.65 plus 1.03 multiplied by 29 minus mean BMI. I could actually write down here that mean BMI was about 28.6, but I'm not going to deliberately because I want to show you that this actually just cancels out in the equations. Okay. Then for a person with a BMI of 30, their body fat percentage is 30.65 plus 1.03 multiplied by 30 minus mean BMI. So the mean difference <clears throat> in body fat percentage between these two people is basically the second equation here minus the first equation here. And when you do that, you'll have 30.65 plus 1.03 times 30 minus mean BMI minus 30.65 plus 1.03 multiplied by 29 minus mean BMI. This 30.65 cancels out and you end up with all the stuff that's multiplied by 1.03, which is 30 minus mean BMI minus 29 minus mean BMI. And remember when you um, go into brackets, a minus and a minus is a plus. So this minus mean BMI cancels out with this positive mean BMI. And then you're just left with 30 minus 29. So you end up with 1.03%. So that's the mean difference in body fat percentage of a person with 30 with a BMI of 30 to compared to a BMI of 29. And you can use that to, you, you, to compare different BMI levels. So for example, if you're comparing someone with a BMI of 31 to a BMI of 29, the mean difference in body fat percentage is going to be 1.03 multiplied by 2, which is, I don't know, what's that? 2.06. Yeah. If you're comparing BMIs that are three units apart, the mean body fat percent difference is going to be uh, three point. <laughs> um, so do 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 you see the pattern there? Um, is that clear? Okay, I'm going to assume that's clear. You can ask. Yeah, clear. You can ask all questions at the end. So it's really difficult. Like I'm just looking at my slide. <laughs> I can't see your face, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so cool. We found the relationship between BMI and body fat percentage. But what about confounders? Because something like sex, right? Um, men on average have higher BMIs, but women on average have higher body fat percentages. So sex is likely to be a confounder of the relationship between BMI and body fat percentage. <laughs> And if I had to redraw that graph, um, that scatter plot that I showed you earlier, 
and I just colored the woman in green and the men in red, you can see right away, oh my gosh, gender's def sex is definitely um, going to be a confounder because look at how all the women, like it's, I mean, this is beautiful. This is why I chose this example, right? Um, all the women up here because they have a higher body fat percentage and all the men are down here. So sex is definitely going to be a confounder. And the way we deal with that is by adjusting for sex in our model. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by regressing um, centered BMI and sex onto body fat percentage, okay? And notice, by the way, here, the R squared has gone from about 29% to like 73%, which like, I mean, I don't know if you, you probably never see this in real life. This R squared is amazing. Um, but that's basically saying that BMI and sex explain 23% in the variation in body fat percentage. So again, we need want to focus on what these coefficients are. And I'm just going to write them down over here. So body fat percentage is equal to 23.42 plus 13.99 times sex plus 1.08 times centered BMI, okay? And we're going to work through what this means for men and for women. So among men, I have coded in this example, by the way, men to be zero and women to be one. So among men, body fat percentage is going to equal 23.42 plus, this is going to be zero because sex is zero. Um, so it's going to be 23.42 plus 1.08 times centered BMI. Okay, so what that means is for men of average BMI, the average body fat percentage is 23.42. For women, the body fat percentage equation is going to equal 23.42 plus 13.99 times 1, so that's just 13.99, plus 1.08 times centered BMI, which works out to 37.41 plus 1.08 times centered BMI. So what that means then is for um, a woman of average BMI, their average body fat percentage is 37.41. And in both for men and for women, a unit increase in BMI is related to a 1.08% increase in body fat percentage, okay? Now, this I'm just going to talk a bit higher level here for a second, because um, linear regression comes from a family of models called generalized linear models, and they all, they all have a lot in common. So when we talk about um, you know, how to fit the models, um, confounders, effect modifiers, all of that, they apply to all these different models. But what varies is how your exposure is related to your outcome. Um, uh, uh, sorry, before we even get there, what matters is the type of outcome variable you have. So over here, we had a continuous outcome variable, which was body fat percentage. And so you think, I need to fit a linear regression. When we have um, a binary outcome variable like high blood pressure, we have to fit a logistic regression. If you want to model counts like the number of times a person falls, you'd be, model you'd be doing a Poisson regression. And if you want to look at survival, like the um, um, amount of time someone survives after a surgery, for example, you'd be doing a Cox regression. But they all come from the same family, and lots of the thinking I've just described to you in the context of linear regression applies to all these other regressions as well. But in terms of interpretation, the main difference is how the exposure relates to the outcome. So, for example, um, over here in the linear regression, we talked about a unit increase in BMI being associated with a 1.08% increase in body fat percentage. But say we were doing a logistic regression where we were modeling the relationship between BMI as our exposure and high blood pressure as our binary outcome. We'd be fitting a logistic regression and we'd be talking about a unit increase in BMI being associated with uh, something higher odds of high blood pressure. And just to give you a really quick detour and example of what I mean by that, here I've drawn the um, distribution of BMI in the population that I've just been talking about. But what I've done is I've colored in blue the people who have normal blood pressure and the people in green 
who have high blood pressure. And you can see that the distribution of people of high blood pressure, their BMI distribution has shifted ever so slightly to the right. So you would expect that the relationship um, between BMI and high blood pressure, there's a slightly increased odds of high blood pressure for a unit increase in BMI. And when you do that, you can see right away here that for a unit increase in BMI, the odds of high blood pressure is 1.1. Well, 1.10, yeah. And I just wanted to quickly highlight this because it's very similar to linear regression. It's just the relationship between how the exposure is related to your outcome varies. But the concept behind it, you know, that I've adjusted for sex as a confounder and so forth, it is exactly the same. But I can, like I said earlier, I can spend a whole um, session talking about logistic regressions if you want. But I just wanted to end here on some words of warning, because I think it's very easy to go into a computer program and just type in, um, I'm going to fit this on this. But you have to think about what you're doing. So the first thing is don't extrapolate. Okay, in our models, um, we had BMI ranging from about 20 to 60. And we were able to show a nice linear relationship between BMI and body fat percentage in that range. But you don't know what's happening below 20 or beyond 60. You don't know if the relationship continues to be linear, if it becomes non-linear, if it plateaus or whatever. So you can't really extrapolate beyond the range that you have. And that's also another reason why you should center your data because um, you wanna be able to say something meaningful about that constant, yeah, for within the range that you have, because like I said, nobody has a BMI of zero, right? The next thing, and um, I've alluded to this already, is that you need to make sure that the data that you're putting into your model is valid and sensible and it has limited measurement error and so forth. Because if you don't, if you're putting like bad data in, you're going to get bad models out. And then the last thing as well here that I wanted to say is that just because you find a relationship between an exposure and an outcome doesn't mean that your exposure causes your outcome. Just because a unit increase in BMI is associated with a 1.08% increase in body fat percentage doesn't mean that an increased BMI causes that increase in body fat percentage. It's just that they're associated but not causal. And that's really important, especially at the moment when you find all these um, studies coming out about like associations of something with coronavirus, for example. Um, and I think that's all that I wanted to say. I wanted to leave lots of time to talk because um, I, I think it's much, you can learn much more by talking than um, me just jabbering on. So yeah, that's all I had to say, but if you all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Mm -hmm.